Hey everyone, just taking a quick 15 seconds to let you know that my new book, The Fitness Mindset, Eat for Energy, Train for Tension, Manage Your Mindset, and Reap the Results, which hit the bestseller list within 24 hours of its release, is now available to buy on Amazon. So if you're looking for everything you need to get into incredible shape and the mindset to keep it forever, be sure to check it out. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. You're listening to the Brian Keane Fitness Podcast, where Irish fitness entrepreneur Brian Keane answers your questions and interviews leaders in the world of fitness, health, mindset, and natural wellness. To share tips about all things that can support you on your journey to becoming the best version of yourself and build a bulletproof mindset to get whatever you want out of life, come join the fun. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Brian Keen Fitness Podcast. We talk everything fitness, nutrition, and mindset to help you with your goals. Today's Q&A comes in from my Snapchat and my Instagram, so if you're not on those platforms, definitely go check them out. They're my most active platforms at the minute. I try and open up Snapchat Q&A every day, Monday to Friday, um, and also try and do Instagram Live Q&As every day, Monday to Friday as well, so be sure to check those out. So first question comes in from David Brown on Snapchat. How can I wake up earlier? I struggle to get up as it is. Um, so I've spoken in different podcasts before and my own issues with sleep in the past. And I'm not a notoriously good sleeper up until recently, up until the last 12 months or so. Um, different issues with anxiety, different issues with bedtime routines. Um, so I've never been a great sleeper with the exception of the last 8, 12 months or so. But getting up, waking up earlier, there's a couple of strategies that I'm going to share here in the hopes that they help anybody listening. And again, waking up earlier is relative. For some people, that's 4 a.m. For some people, that's 9 a.m. Um, so for me, I normally get up every day at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. the latest. And there's a couple of strategies that I do Monday to Friday that allow me to do this. One is understanding the REM cycles and knowing that we drop into 90-minute REM rapid eye movement sleep cycles. And when you're waking up halfway between one rim cycle dropping into another, it can be very difficult to get out of bed because you feel very, very groggy and tired. So I spoke in my book, The Fitness Mindset, about the 90 minute rim cycle. So making sure that you're going to bed for six hours, seven and a half hours or nine hours, and then waking up ending one rim cycle about to go into the other so that it's a lot easier to get out of bed in the morning because you don't feel as groggy. Again, finding out your sweet spot. For me, it's seven and a half hours. Um, once I get my seven and a half hours, Monday to Friday, I feel amazing and I work great. Six I can do for one or two days, but then it catches up and nine is actually too much for me. Um, so find your sweet spot, experiment with that. A lot of it will come down to the stress in your life, the training program you're on, your nutritional plan, how much sleep you need, your genetics and all the other uh, things that can affect your sleep. But waking up at the end of a rim cycle can be very, very effective at allowing you to do the first step to getting out of bed and getting up earlier. So for me, I know it takes me about half an hour to unwind before bed. So if I'm getting up at 5 a.m., I'll try and get to bed for nine and just completely unwind for half an hour, knowing that lights out at half nine and I'm gonna fall asleep and get my seven and a half hours. The same as if I'm waking up at six, I'll do the same thing at 10 p.m. till half 10 and then I'll do it that way. Um, so that's what works for me in terms of making sure I have that half an hour unwind, which effectively makes it eight hours. Um, so it makes sense where that general eight hour rule would come from when you're factoring in your rim cycles. So that is one step. But on top of that, I because I'm not a morning person by nature, um, it takes me about 45 minutes to an hour to even get going in the morning. One of the reasons I like getting up so early is because the rest of the world hasn't woken up yet and I can get some food in me and then I'm more sociable and I feel right after about an hour um, because I can't talk to anybody in the morning. I'm that guy that I just can't even string a sentence together. So what I normally do is making sure I have something to look forward to first thing in the morning can really, really help. So I normally preload a podcast or an audio book that I'm listening to that I'm really into and then as soon as I wake up in the morning I plug it straight in and I start listening to it it's normally something to do with an activity I have that day or some form of business podcast that is going to allow me to shape the entire day my Monday to Friday is a heavy focus on business helping as many people as I can working with my clients so it's normally something to do with business or something to do with health or something to do with that area of life so that I'm able to switch my mind into that 
focus for the day and it's something I'm looking forward to the night before. So that for you may be completely different. That may be a sports podcast. That may be your favorite fiction book that you're listening to on Audible or a different audiobook app. That could be whatever it is that's going to allow you to look forward to waking up in the morning. So my advice is have that preloaded, ready to go first thing. Also, something that really, really has helped me over the last few months is I try and train in the mornings now. So next year, I've got the Marathon de Sable, which is the Marathon of the Sands. It's five back-to-back marathons, but an ultra marathon in the Sahara Desert in Morocco. So I've started training first thing in the morning now because it's the only time of the day when I can extend a two or three hour training period to get my amount of endurance runs done. Um, And looking forward to going to the gym is something that really allows me to spring out of bed in the morning. Um, So I also advise anything that you look forward to doing, try and factor it into your morning routine so that you're able to look forward to getting out of bed every single morning. If you're getting straight out of bed and you're going straight to work and you don't even like your job, it's very, very hard to wake up earlier. However, if you're getting up to go to the gym because you love training or you're getting up to listen to your favorite audiobook or your favorite podcast, or even your favorite meal. I've had people come through my top 50 program in particular who have done some of the recipes in there, the protein waffles or protein pancakes, and they're like, this gets me out of bed every morning. So waking up to your favorite meal can also be a springboard for waking up earlier. And then it's just a case of going to bed on time so that you get the amount of sleep that your body needs and then forming a habit. The University of London says it takes 66 days to form a new habit. So even though the first week is gonna be very, very difficult to getting up at five, or getting up at six or getting up at seven or whatever your new time is as the month goes on it gets easier and easier and easier and then after six six days that just becomes your new habit and you don't even think about it anymore so they're the main tips that i would offer and for anybody that struggles to get up in the morning or would like to wake up earlier as somebody that has probably put the factor down to one of the major things that has changed in my life over the last three or four years, obviously alongside the birth of my daughter, giving me kind of new fire and a why, is getting up earlier and reading more books. My entire life has changed from those two implementations that I've done, from going from a full-time primary school teacher, um, not really liking his job, not really loving life, to being able to help and serve more people and do and have things that I never dreamed of having or being able to do came, comes down to getting up earlier in the morning and reading more books. When you combine those two, which is effectively what I do in the mornings now, it can change the entire trajectory of your life because you're taking control of your morning, which effectively allows you to take control of your day and it can give you more hours and make you feel more rested. So you can change your body composition. You can look the way you want to look. You can get your training sessions in. You can listen to or read the books you want to read and you can change your life and go in the direction that you were born to live or go in the direction of whatever it is that's going to make you the most happy. Um, so they're kind of my top tips on waking up earlier and hopefully that will help a lot. Next question comes in from Loney085 on Snapchat. What are your thoughts on smoking? It's more just on nights out, but will it affect me? Um, okay, so smoking is, I love the Charlie Munger quote that you shouldn't have an opinion on anything unless you can argue the opposite side better than the people standing on that side. And smoking is probably one of the only things on the planet that I can't argue a positive side for. Um, and there's everything else. Now, by all means, a little bit of moderation if you're factoring it in. Uh, but I really, really struggle for any benefits for smoking. Um, the tobacco, again, it's been consistently proven over and over again to cause cancer. It's going to have a negative effect on your health. It's going to make you age faster. It's going to give you all kind of addictive issues. It's very, very hard to put a positive on that. So in terms of only having it on nights out, again, it's probably better than smoking 10, 20 packs a day. But there's a couple of things that I would advise looking into just and then deciding, is it something that you want to continue doing? So on the basis of the fact that I can't argue any benefits for it, the truth is a lot of smoking, even on nights out, and when you ask, is it going to affect you, I assume you mean in the terms of health and overall the way you're going to feel, and by all means, yes, it definitely will, um, because it's such has such a negative impact on your body that even consistently over weekends and smoking areas having cigarettes can have a negative impact on your health. So what I would advise is 
understanding that smoking cigarettes isn't necessarily just a physical addiction because if that was the case, everybody that gave up cigarettes would just go on a nicotine patch or a nicotine gel and nicotine is the ingredient that you become addicted to. It's not the tobacco, it's the nicotine that is addictive. So if that was the case, everyone that used a nicotine patch or a gum would take that and then they wouldn't crave cigarettes anymore and then they'd be fine and they'd never go back on them again. But that's not what happens to people. What happens is you create bad habits and environmental issues and environmental habits around smoking, such as going out to a smoking area on nights out, which can re-trigger the bad habit. So from a physiological point of view, you're covered with nicotine patches. You're not going to get a physical craving. And for a lot of people that smoke on nights out, particularly in smoking areas in a club or a bar, you're not physically addicted because you're just made the bad association of having a couple of drinks, your inhibitions might be lower, or you've made the actual mental habit, habitual connection with being in a smoking area that, oh, I need to have a cigarette because I'll get that little bit of a nicotine hit, hit will make, which will make me feel better. It'll give me a mild stimulant effect and I'm going to feel really good. So that's what happens when you're smoking every weekend. You've made that association. So whether you do or continue to do it or not is very much down to your own personal choice. Everyone has their own choice in what they put into their body, what they use, but understand that you may not be physically addicted, you've just created a bad habit. And it's very, very easy, very, very simple, not very, very easy to cut a bad habit. So there's a great book by Charles Duhigg called The Power of Habit. And he talks about the Q routine reward that all habits that we form are a cue, which for effectively for someone in the smoking area is being in a bar or a club, the routine is going out to the smoking area and then the reward is the serotonin hit or the stimulant hit you're getting from the cigarette. So understanding that you need to hijack that somewhere can allow you to stop that completely. One thing is making sure that you don't go out to a smoking area in a bar. So you know that you go into that routine that if you're in a smoking area, you have to say no. And if you don't want to slip, don't go to slippery places. So if you don't put yourself in a position where you have to say no and then use willpower, that is going to make it a lot easier for you to not have to make that decision. So one step you can do is just by not going out to a smoking area. Another one is going to a bar where there is no smoking area so that you change up your entire queue and you change up the actual routine that you have on nights out that you're not going to the same bar every single week. Because what happens is you're going to the same bar or the same club, the same smoking area, and then that routine is massively developed and is hardwired in your system. I love the quote for habits that the Chains of habits are too loose to be felt until they're too strong to be broken. And that's kind of how smoking on nights out is. The habit becomes so hardwired in you that it makes it very, very difficult to give up. So if it is something that you really want to make a change with and you're not just justifying it to yourself, by all means, go out every weekend and have your cigarettes and justify it to yourself. But don't confuse yourself into thinking that, well, it's fine, I'm only smoking one or two every weekend. It's fine. Richard Feynman, who was a physicist, and one of my favorite quotes of all time, don't fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. And by all means, go out and have your cigarettes every weekend, have your smoking in your smoking area, but don't fool yourself into thinking it's healthy just because you're not doing it every single day because it's not. And you can justify it to yourself all you want. But again, the stories you tell yourself are going to be how you see situations. So don't fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. By all means, Definitely factor them in if you choose to. Just don't convince yourself you're doing something healthy. Okay, next question comes in from Anonymous. How can I stop being bullied? Um, so I'm going to answer this one in the hopes that it provides a lot of value to people listening because bullying shows up in different ways. Um, from this context of this question, I think it's somebody in school or college, but there's people that are in work environments um, or that have kids that are going through the same thing where there's people being bullied. And the truth is... For me, I was someone that was bullied in school when I was a teenager. It was one of my reasons for starting to lift weights because I wanted to be stronger. And to be honest, with full transparency, I wanted to be able to beat the shit out of the people that were bullying me. And that's what led me into weight training initially because I wanted to be bigger and stronger. Um, but the truth is that what happens when you start to lift weights and feel stronger, you start to feel more confident within yourself and then you start actually don't even want to get back to people that are bullying you and what happens is bullies in all areas of life in school in college in workplaces normally prey on people that are weak and the people that don't have the confidence and what happens when you start building up self-confidence within yourself and whatever that is for you whether it's lifting weights getting stronger or doing better in your sports team or whatever it is that's giving you more confidence 
you tend to not end up being a prey for bullies anymore. Um, so it's a hard question to answer and I just wanted to answer it purely because it's something I've gone through myself um, and what I did. And I'm not saying it's the best thing to do, but for me, if you're someone that is of that 14, 15, 16 year old age or whatever age it is, or you've got kids or friends or brothers or sisters who are going through it, the thing that changed for me was I started lifting weights. I started doing push-ups in my bedroom. I started doing pull-ups in my bedroom. I started to get physically stronger because when my confidence builds up, you don't become a victim anymore. People that are going to bully you and people that are going to pick on you is normally because they see you as weak and you're not going to fight back. And generally, bullies have their own insecurities going on. It's normally a projection of what's going on within them. Right now, if I'm ever offering that advice, and I have a lot of young people following my Snapchat particularly, that ask about being bullied understanding the psychology behind a bully is normally a projection of what's going on in their life there's something going on in their life and they're taking it out on you the same thing happens for 27 28 year olds who are in an office where there's somebody picking on somebody it's a projection what you'll find is a bully has a somebody picking on them they have a family member that's always picking on them a brother or sister even a mother or father and they're projecting because they feel weak in those situations that they're projecting it onto you in a place where they feel strong and secure within themselves because they're able to make somebody feel bad about themselves it makes them feel good about themselves makes them feel good about them and the same thing happens in an office what you will find in a lot of situations with people that are bullying other guys or other girls are making fun of them or constantly on their back for something it's normally because of something going on in their home environment their family environment where their wife or their husband is always picking on them or they run the roost at home and this is where they get to show themselves as a real man or a real woman and they get to pick on somebody and make them feel bad about themselves it's just a projection of what's going on in their life and understanding that normally allows you to empathize massively with the people that are doing the bullying because even though you're the victim and you, we can't sometimes see the forest amongst the trees, what happens when you start to realize that people that are bullying you have something going on in their life and they're just projecting it onto you, it makes you feel sorry for them. Um, and then when you start to build up your own confidence through weightlifting or joining a sports team or getting better at something that makes you feel confident within yourself, you start moving forward as a person. You start feeling better about yourself and you just start to see the bullies in a completely different way. On top of that, they normally stop bullying you when you build that self-confidence. So hopefully that helps in terms of understanding that a lot of it is a projection of the way and what's going on in their life and it's just being shown on to you. And then when you build your own self-confidence, it allows you to take control of the situation and you can move out of it by being confident in yourself because at the end of the day, bullies never pick on somebody who's confident within themselves. Okay, next question comes in from Boy 16 I'm spending over an hour in the gym. How long should my sessions be? Um, okay, so in terms of session length is largely going to be down to your specific goals um, and then you obviously build your nutritional strategy around whatever training you're doing so i have a couple of general rules and neither are right or wrong it's very much down to what you're specifically doing if you're a power lifter and you're resting five or six minutes between sets to maximize your lifts you might be training for two hours if you're for example me i'm training for the marathon de sabla 256 kilometer race through the sahara desert my workouts now are stretching to two, three hours because I'm doing 20 kilometer runs at the end of workouts. I'm doing 25 kilometer runs at the end of workouts. So my workouts are now stretching on. However, when body composition is your goal or athletic performance is your goal or a combination of both is your goal, under an hour is always going to be key. The truth is, if you're trying to change the way your body looks, either lose body fat, build muscle, a combination of both, or improve your performance on the pitch as an athlete, you don't need to be spending more than an hour in the gym. Anything over that is normally just down to the fact that your quality of your workout wasn't good enough, that you haven't been timing your rest periods, or you were on your phone or talking to friends. Your workout shouldn't be going over an hour. For example, to give context to this answer, in my Top 50 program or in my GA Lean Body program, None of those workouts go over an hour with the exception of week three and week six in my top 50 program where we plug in finishers to push on metabolic response so that you push past any plateau and allows your body to really ramp up its metabolism may push on a workout over an hour. But that's the exception rather than the rule to push, push past a plateau when you're consistently going over an hour in the gym 
and you're training for composition and how you want your body to look, whether a guy or a girl looking to lose body fat, look better in a bikini or get abs in a six pack, you don't need to be going over an hour. That's a sign that your rest periods haven't been tracked, you haven't factored in your program properly and you're not gonna get the best bang for your buck. By all means, if you're prepping for a bikini show or a men's physique or a bodybuilding show, you may stretch it into an hour and a half, two hours because you're doing your cardio at the end of your workout but it's probably not the most effective use of your time in terms of getting a better bang for your buck. Because the truth is, if you're better, in my opinion, to get an incredible 50 minute, 55 minute workout where you're testing and timing your rest periods, where you're failing at your given rep range, you're keeping the intensity high, than to be in the gym for two hours where you're kind of faffing about. Because it's not about the time you spend in the gym, it's not about the quantity you spend in the workout, it's about the quality of the workout. So again, always base it around your goals, but if it's body composition and changing the way your body looks, you probably don't need more than an hour and unless you're trying to combat having your nutritional strategy off, which is probably a sign that it's worth looking at your nutrition and getting that dialed in so that's in alignment with your training program so that you can do less and get more and you can do it over a consistent period of time and that your life isn't spent two, three hours every day in the gym, that you're getting your workouts in, you're keeping them high quality, you've got your nutritional strategy right and you're changing your body compositions, so you're feeling better, you're looking better and you, your energy levels are better as a result and that's my personal opinion on terms of how long sessions should be and how it works for each individual person. Okay, next question comes in from Anonymous. Um, my question is, how do I break through the mindset of accepting mediocrity as a baseline? I've been good today, so I deserve this, and excel to get any nutrition and training on point simultaneously. Um, okay, so the accepting mediocrity as a baseline is normally, and again, I can speak through this as somebody that did this probably until the age of 22, 23, even 25, when I really started to come into my own and how I wanted my life to go. Your baseline is all what you story you've told yourself and all the limitations that you create are all self-limiting -limit limitations. You've created them, they're all self-created. And what happened in one of the biggest lessons I've learned over the last three, four or five years is if mediocre is your baseline, your baseline comes from not setting your bar high enough. And for me, and again, I'll use myself because you're your own best example, I know when I set goals, I have to set BHAGs, I have to set big, hairy, audacious goals, I have to set massive targets because otherwise I can't get molded for it, made it for them. There's a reason that I signed up for the Marathon de Sabla, the 256 kilometer, which is five marathons and an ultra back to back, and I've yet to do a marathon because I have to set my target massive in order to get motivated. It was the same when I did the Worlds when I was a professional fitness model. I had to go to the Las Vegas Worlds pay-per-view show and compete there because I wanted to test myself against the best in the world. I have to set my targets massive for me to get motivated by them. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It's a little bit reverse engineering what works best for you. But I know myself that I have to set that bar high or else I can't get motivated. But that came from a hijack of using a step-by-step -step lifestyle parameter and understanding that my bar moves in slow increments in the beginning and then exponentially and very, very fast as you start to hit your targets more and more. Confidence comes from saying you're going to do something and then doing it. And mediocrity being the baseline normally comes from the fact that you're always sticking to the safe path of what you know you can do. And I put in my own book, The Fitness Mindset, the Vincent van Gogh quote, that the comfort zone is a great place, but nothing ever grows there. And that's exactly how your baseline mediocrity bar is. If you constantly stay in your comfort zone with everything that you do, the relationships you're in, the jobs that you do, the activities or body composition or fitness goals that you set if you constantly stay in your fitness and your comfort zone then nothing ever grows there and that's what happens for me when i made my first major jump was when i decided i was going to start competing first it's one of the reasons i had my own issues with biodysmorphia and all the other pros and cons that come with competing and bodybuilding and becoming a professional fitness model and all these things that i did one of the major transitions for me was once upon a time stepping on stage as a professional fitness model or as a bodybuilder terrified me. Even the thoughts of it terrified me to do. And then when I did it, I realized that, okay, what else is scaring me? What other limitations have I self-created? And then you start to attack those. 
And then as you do that, it becomes a habit because you don't have a habit of having a poor baseline. You don't, you're, you don't have a mediocrity of having a bad baseline. You have a habit of having a mediocrity as your baseline because when you have a habit of having greatness or success or big things as your baseline, then that becomes the habit that you fulfill every single day. And that comes from setting big goals and working towards them and coming out of your comfort zone. How you do anything is how you do everything. So it doesn't matter. One of the reasons that I love fitness so much is because it's a, 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 metaphor for everything in your life going into the gym and pushing past limits and doing workouts that you don't want to do and pushing to the point of pain and pushing past that and doing the extra reps when you don't think you can and doing the extra sets when you don't think you can transfers into every area of your life it transfers into your relationships it transfers into your jobs it transfers into how you do everything in your life and that comes from practicing moving out of your comfort zone so one of the things that has given me such a reference point has been my fitness those workouts on the days when I didn't want to train those reps that I did that I didn't want to do all of these things because when you're sitting in front of a computer or you're sitting in front of a desk or you're sitting across the table from someone who's potentially going to be your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife and you're not feeling comfortable you go back to that reference point of when you didn't feel comfortable and the growth that came out as a result growth comes from pushing past resistance on the things that you think you can't do so my goal or my advice for anybody who is trying to push past their mediocrity as their baseline is set goals higher move out of your comfort zone in all areas of your life and when you start to tell yourself i've been good enough today so i deserve this with your nutrition or your training that's a self-fitting prophecy that's a story you're telling yourself that becomes a habit and that becomes a new habit that oh well I had a good training session today I can eat whatever I want and that's fine but if you're not if you're trying to accept or trying to excel into something that is more than mediocrity or more than average because greatness is within everybody everybody has it everybody has genius everybody has greatness there's a fucking reason that when you see people doing great things that it resonates within you and you think it's incredible and you feel motivated that's because that's fucking within you everybody has that just you've decided to tell yourself another story and you've decided to go against it by telling yourself, well, this is good enough. If anything anybody says, your Conor McGregor's, your Muhammad Ali's, your people that are achieving great things in the world, if they're resonating with you, that's because that greatness is within you as well. You're just choosing to ignore it or you're choosing not to listen to that voice that's inside you. Set the bar higher and then realize that when you feel that way, there's a reason for it. So set your bar, set your big, hairy, audacious goals or set your goals that are outside your comfort zone and then start practicing them start how you do anything how you do everything start with it in the gym start it with your nutrition saying i'm going to follow this nutritional plan for six weeks i'm going to follow this training program for 12 weeks i'm going to do it because confidence comes from doing the things that you said you were going to do and following through on that and when that becomes a habit when that becomes your way of being when that becomes the way you do everything because how you do anything is how you do everything then you start moving your baseline and it doesn't become mediocrity anymore. Your baseline becomes greatness. Your great your baseline becomes success or whatever that looks like for you. Greatness, success are all subjective terms and what they mean for you. But you need to set that bar higher, push yourself out of your comfort zone and then do it every single day with everything that you're doing. Step by step, we get ahead, not necessarily in fast spurts. How you build your body, rep by rep. How you run a marathon, step by step. How you write a book, word by word. You do everything bit by bit every single day when you start doing the right things every single day moving to, towards the person and the goals of the person that you want to become that's how you get greatness or that's how you get success or whatever that looks like for you and that's how you move your baseline of mediocrity to a baseline of the person that you were supposed to be Okay, that's everything on today's episode. So for more information on me or my top 50 or GA Lean Body program, check out the website, www.briankeyfitness.com. My Snapchat is BrianK019. My Facebook, Instagram, YouTube is all Brian K Fitness. And my best-selling book, The Fitness Mindset, is available on Amazon, the book depository in all Dubly bookstores in Ireland. Massive thank you for listening. Catch you all soon.